Hello and welcome to this worship service. My name is Carmen Little and I'm a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry. It is my pleasure to be able to worship with you today. God is our salvation, guiding us out of the darkness of the world, redeeming God. As trees stretch towards the sun, we seek your healing light. God is our salvation when we hunger for direction and meaning. Sustaining God, as branches bear fruit, your food, your word feeds our souls. Come now, put down the burdens of your days. God is our salvation. We rest in the garden of God's reconciling love. We begin in prayer. Righteous one, to you alone we lift our souls. In you alone we place our trust. For you alone we wait all day long. For you are the God of our salvation, abounding in mercy and steadfast love. Help us remain alert and watchful for the coming of your promised one, the one who comes with power and glory, the one drawing near to bring our salvation. Amen. The simplest definition of salvation is to be delivered or rescued from peril. It is connected with the need to be saved. The most common meaning of salvation is to be saved by God from the consequences of our sin. However, the Bible speaks of our salvation in a bit fuller terms than simply being rescued from eternal damnation in hell. When thinking about salvation, it's helpful to think about what we are saved from, what we are saved to, and who we are saved by. It's also helpful to think about our salvation as a past, present, and future happening. Listening to some modern songs, sayings, and even church leaders, one might think the primary thing we are saved from these days is purposelessness. Others speak of salvation from drug addiction or shattered relationships. Yet others speak of difficult circumstances which we are facing. While the Bible certainly speaks of God's redemption from futility, purposelessness, and suffering, this is not the primary problem which humanity faces. In the Old Testament, the primary Hebrew word, which is translated as save or salvation, often refers to deliverance in concrete, real-life situations. In 2 Kings chapter 19, Hezekiah prays for the Lord to save them from the Assyrians. Though there are massive spiritual implications to this, the deliverance he longs for is primarily in the present. Likewise, in Psalm 54, when David asks for God to save him, he is thinking foremost about being delivered from the hand of Saul, who is tracking him down. The Old Testament establishes God as the Deliverer and Savior. John MacArthur summarizes well, The real problem is sin and guilt. That's the issue. God sent Jesus Christ to rescue us from the consequences of our sin, and everybody falls into the category of sinner. It doesn't matter whether you're among the haves or the have-nots, whether you have great expectations or none at all, whether you're consumed by your passions or exhibit a degree of self-control and discipline. You still are a sinner. You have broken the law of God, and he's angry about it. Unless something happens to change your condition, you're on your way to eternal hell. You need to be rescued from the consequences of your sin. Those are the principal issues the gospel solves. We see then that salvation speaks of receiving deliverance from our greatest problem, namely the many consequences of our sin against a holy God. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30, a Philippian jailer asks a very important question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The apostles did not hesitate in pointing to Jesus Christ as the only means by which people will be saved. Those in the Old Testament looked to God alone as their Savior. This is picked up in the New Testament when Jesus is referred to as our Lord and Savior. God is the one who enacts salvation. The scriptures are clear that the way of unbelief is to trust in self or in other things. This is where the image of a, salva a salvage yard is somewhat helpful. When a salvage yard reclaims a wrecked car, they take possession of it, change it substantially, and repurpose it. Though far less utilitarian, 
This is true of believers. Salvation is not only being saved from something, it is also being saved to someone. We are saved from sin and brought to God. The scriptures speak of the many benefits of salvation. John 8.36 helps us see that we have been set free. We are rescued from bondage and brought into freedom. I appreciate these words of John Piper. Indeed, there are 10,000 gifts that flow from the love of God. The gospel of Christ proclaims the news that he has purchased by his death 10,000 blessings for his bride. But none of these gifts will lead to final joy if they have not been first led by God. And not one gospel blessing will be enjoyed by anyone for whom the gospel's greatest gift was not the Lord himself. Repentance and belief are really two sides of the same coin. Repentance means that we are changing our mind about God and about ourselves. We are laying down our own foolish efforts to save ourselves. We are turning away from self-sufficiency. At the same time, we are turning towards Christ. We trust that he alone is the one who can save us. We are entrusting ourselves to him. Salvation is our past, present, and future. Christ has died in history on our behalf. We are still in the process of being saved. We also see a future component to our salvation. As Romans 5 says, we shall be saved. Nothing can compare with all that is ours in Christ when we find salvation, forgiveness, justification, eternal life. What a glorious life the gospel offers to those who are searching for purpose and meaning, to those who have found that materialism is not the answer to the deepest yearnings of the heart. The crowning glory of salvation is promised when we enter into the presence of our Lord and Savior. We have a home in heaven reserved for us. No wonder the gospel is good news. Unfortunately, many people today have distorted the meaning of salvation, saying that it means only political, social, and economic liberation in this life. Certainly, Christians should be concerned about injustice and do what they can to promote a more just world. But lasting and complete liberation from social injustice will only come when Jesus Christ returns to establish his kingdom. Biblical salvation is far deeper because it gets to the root of our problem, the problem of sin. Only Christ can change the human heart and replace greed and hate with compassion and love. Do you understand God's plan of salvation? We are all sinners and stand under the judgment of God, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We might believe that we are good enough to win God's favor or that we can perform certain religious acts to counterbalance our bad deeds. But the Bible states that we are all condemned, for there is no one righteous, not even one. We need to understand that Christ has done to make our salvation possible. God loves us, and Christ came to make forgiveness and salvation possible. What did he do? Jesus died on the cross as the complete sacrifice for our sins. He took upon himself the judgment that we deserve. We need to respond to God's work. God, in his grace, offers us the gift of eternal life. But like any gift, it becomes ours only when we receive it. We must repent of our sins. Repentance carries with it the idea of confession, sorrow, turning, and changing. We cannot ask forgiveness over and over again for our sins and then return to those sins, expecting God to forgive us. We must turn from our practice of sin as best we know how and turn by faith to Christ as our Lord and Savior. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Ephesians chapter 2. Christ invites us to come to him, and God has promised to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We must understand the cost of coming to Christ and following Christ. Jesus constantly called upon those who would follow him to count the cost. A person must determine to leave their sins behind and turn from them. 
Some people, unfortunately, may be unwilling to do so, and there may be other costs as well when we decide to follow Christ. In some cultures, a person who turns to Christ may be disowned by family, alienated from social life, and even imprisoned or killed. The ultimate cost of true discipleship is the cost of renouncing self, self-will, self-plans, self-motivations. Christ is to be Lord of our lives. Jesus declared, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus does not call us to a life of selfish comfort and ease. He calls us to follow him. He calls us to give up our own plans and to follow him without reservation, even to death. Yes, it costs to follow Christ, but it also costs not to follow Christ. It costs the Apostle Paul the prestige of a high-level position in the Jewish nation. But he declared, Whatever was to my profit I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Christ calls men and women not only to trust him as Savior, but also to follow him as Lord. Salvation is ultimately linked to the cross. The man who hung there between two thieves was without sin. His virgin birth by the miraculous intervention of the Holy Spirit meant that he did not inherit a sinful human nature. Neither did he commit any sin during his lifetime. Mary gave birth to the perfect child. He became the only perfect human. As such, he was uniquely qualified to put into action God's plan of salvation for mankind. Why was Calvary's cross so special, so different from hundreds of other crosses used for Roman executions? It was because on that cross, Jesus suffered the punishment for sin that we all deserve. He was our substitute. He suffered the judgment and condemnation of death that our sinful nature and deeds deserve. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul knew there was a built-in power in the cross and the resurrection. Our faith is essential for salvation, but we must be absolutely clear on what we mean when we speak of salvation by faith. There are various kinds of belief or faith, and not all are linked to salvation. In the New Testament, faith means more than intellectual belief. It involves trust and commitment. I may say that I believe a bridge will hold my weight, but I really believe it only when I commit myself and walk across it. Saving faith involves an act of commitment and trust in which I commit my life to Jesus Christ and trust him alone as my Savior and Lord. Saving faith is a commitment to Jesus as Savior and Lord. It is a personal and individual decision. It is more than assent to historical or theological truth given to us in God's word. It is faith in the promises of God that all who trust in Christ will not perish but have eternal life. This is truly good news. Let us, God's people, pray. Jesus, our light and our salvation, grant us the desire to be proclaimers of your good news, to beckon the world to your shore, and to be among those caught up in the nets of your saving grace. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy and answer us. O God, our refuge and our strength, endow us this day with faithfulness and fortitude to be united with one purpose and one mind as devoted messengers of your word and sacrifice. We ask through Jesus, the captain of our ship, and the Holy Spirit, our navigator, who with you are one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.